Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. I have the pleasure today to have a good friend of mine today with us here tonight, uh, Erminio Guevara, Southern England Conference Coordinator for the Pathfinders and Adventures team. And he's going to bring you some wonderful instructions today. Herminio, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hello, Pathfinders. My name is Herminio, and Jesus is, dear, is a dear friend of mine. I want to welcome you to this everybody. insect Thank honor. Thank you for joining us tonight. It is a pleasure to I be here to and uh, with Jesus to, uh, to present this honor. My hope is that you can see God's wonderful world, or God's work in the wonderful world of insects. So, Jesus, you could take hello, it away. Pathfinders. Welcome. Uh, hello, Pathfinders. Welcome. Hello, Pathfinders. My name is Herminio, and Jesus is, dear, is a dear friend of mine. Hello, Pathfinders. Welcome to the Insect Honor. My name is Herminio Guevara, and I will be leading this presentation. Before we start, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We're so blessed to be here to study insects. I ask you to be with each Pathfinder, with their parents, with their church, with their directors and their clubs. Allow the Holy Spirit to use this moment in time to impress upon us the lessons that you want us to learn from nature. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, before we study the insects, let's see what the Bible has to say about nature and using nature to learn about insects and all about God. But ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds in the sky and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish in the sea inform you, which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. Job 12, verses 7 through 10. In a piece of paper, I need to write down all the characteristics of insects mentioned in the video that you're going to see. So your job is to write them down and you could pause the video at any moment in time to help you write this information down. So here we go. All about insects. They crawl on leaves. They fly through the air. They even dig in the ground. Insects are practically everywhere. They live on every continent, including Antarctica, although they prefer to live in warm areas. You are probably familiar with some common insects like bees, ants, and butterflies. But insects are the largest group of animals on Earth. Nearly a million species have been identified so far and scientists estimate that there could be millions more just waiting to be discovered. Insects are invertebrates, or animals that do not have backbones. In fact, insects do not have any bones at all. Instead, they have a hard outer shell, called an exoskeleton, that gives them their structure. Insects have three main sections of their bodies, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They have six legs that are connected to the <coughs> thorax. Most insects also have wings and antennae. Although insects breathe air, they do not have lungs. Instead, they have a system of tubes and sacs through which air may pass or be pumped. This system can only carry air so far into the insect's body, and it is this that limits how large insects can grow. Although there are some very large insects on our planet, they cannot grow as large as other types of animals, because after a certain size they could not get enough air into their bodies to support themselves. Another interesting insect characteristic is their eyes. Insects have a special kind of eyes called compound eyes. Compound eyes are made up of hundreds or even thousands of tiny light-sensitive units. 
Each unit sees only a small part of the insect's surroundings, but all of them together create a mosaic image, a pattern of light and dark dots. Overall, insects do not see as well as humans do, and only some can see colors, but their eyes are excellent at detecting motion. Insects are cold-blooded, which means that they cannot control their body temperature. That is why insects usually live in warm places, and why you do not see as many insects during the winter as you do during the summer. To survive the cold, some insects enter a state called diapause, which is their version of hibernation, and will not become active again until warm weather returns. Insects hatch from eggs, and although some insects hatch as basically small versions of the adults of their species, others go through an incredible change before adulthood. It is called metamorphosis, from a word meaning to transform. The most famous example of metamorphosis in insects is the butterfly. Butterflies begin their lives as caterpillars and spend a few weeks eating and increasing in size. Once they are fully grown, the caterpillars will attach themselves to the underside of a leaf or branch and form a pupa, or chrysalis. The chrysalis hardens into a protective case, and over the next few weeks, the caterpillar inside transforms into a butterfly. When the butterfly is ready to emerge, the chrysalis splits open, but the butterfly cannot fly yet. It hangs upside down, pumping fluid into its wings to make them expand, and slowly opens and closes them to help them dry. Once its wings are ready, the butterfly takes off to find flowers to drink from. Eventually, it will lay eggs of its own, and the cycle starts all over again. Crawling or flying, alone or with thousands of friends, insects by the millions are incredibly important to life on Earth. Some insects are beneficial to humans, while others are pests. But no matter their shape, size, or color, insects make a big difference for such small creatures. I hope this helped you learn more about insects today. Goodbye till next time. There you have it. All about insects. I hope you guys wrote many notes about different characteristics of insects. So what does the Bible say about insects? Let's see. Leviticus 11:22. Of day you may eat the locust of any kind, the bald locust of any kind, the cricket of any kind, and the grasshopper of any kind. Definitely we know that in the United States, grasshopper is not part of our meal plan. But in other countries, grasshopper is part of their meal plan. They will even grind them and put them as part of uh, ingredients in their meals. Or they will saute them and just eat them like that. So grasshopper is one of those creatures that we could eat. In Proverbs 6, 6, it says, go to the end, O sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. So we can study the end and gain some wisdom from how God created them and how they behave in a, in a structured society. Here we go. Next one, how to collect insects. You're going to be asked to create a um, collection of insects. So there are many ways to collect them. First, you could use traps. You could use funnel traps, pitfall yeah. traps, bottle traps, malaise traps, flight interception traps. No, no, traps, no, I'm trying to and other I'm types trying of traps to see if I can that uses some, the on this some thing bait to, chatting, to attract not letting them. Me go through. Here we have two okay. individuals that are using Don't some worry, of the okay. traps we'll that were out. mentioned before. The one on the left, she uses a, she's using a pitfall trap, and the one on the right, she's using a, just a netting. And you will notice that they, she, on the left, they tap the, the branches and insects will fall into the trap. Or with the 
uh, netting, you just patch it or brush it through uh, the bush and it will collect some insects. Next thing I'm going to ask you to do as part of your final project is to classify the insects. Now remember, there is the common name and there is also the scientific name. The scientific name is always composed of two names. One is the genus and the other one is the species. So as you watch this video, I want you to look at the taxonomy system and also specifically write down the six, sorry, the orders. This presenter uh, does, does a good job in presenting different orders. I need you to write them down and the examples for each order, okay? That's gonna be part of your final project. So here we go. Taxonomy. Today, I'm gonna provide a brief introduction to the orders of insects, which generates two important questions. What's an order and what's an insect? Let's get some answers. We'll start with orders. An order is a level of ranking used in taxonomy. Taxonomy is the system of naming and classifying anything from cars to chocolate. But what we're interested in is biodiversity. The taxonomic system used today is based on one developed by Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus in 1753. It's called the Latin binomial system because every species is given two Latin or Latinized names. Take this bumblebee. Its Latin binomial name is Bombus terrestris. No other creature on Earth has that name. Terrestris is the species name given to that specific type of bumblebee. Bombus is the name of the genus, the next level of ranking up, and is shared by all bumblebees. But where does order come into this? Well, genus and species are set within a bigger ranking system that starts with kingdom and heads all the way down to species and sometimes beyond. You can remember the names of the categories using this helpful mnemonic. King Philip can only fly green spaceships. But feel free to make up your own. So, insect orders are all the order categories within the insect class. And what are insects? Well, there's no simple answer that would be too easy. But the best definition is that they have six legs at some point in their life cycle. Now, if you remember one thing about insect orders, remember this, there are loads of them, 26 in the UK alone. And because you don't wanna grow old watching this video, here are some of the most easily spotted ones to get you started. Odonata contains dragonflies and their daintier relatives Damselflies, both are ferocious predators of insects, but harmless to humans. Orthoptera, grasshoppers and crickets, famous for their ability to make noises through stridulation, the process of rubbing parts of their body together. Isoptera, termites, famous for their ability to eat wood, which they can only digest with the help of special bacteria living in their stomachs. Also, one of only two orders in which social behavior is found. Hemiptera, true bugs. In science, the term bug refers to a specific type of insect, those with piercing mouth parts used for sucking insect and plant juices. Coleoptera, beetles. The most obvious features are the hard wing cases, or elytra, that meet in a neat line down the beetle's back. Diptera, flies. Includes hoverflies, which mimic bees and wasps for protection. Lepidoptera, Butterflies and moths. Well, you probably all know what they are, and the difference between a moth and a butterfly? There's no easy answer, but I'm sure a future episode will have fun trying to find one. Hymenoptera. The second order to contain examples of social behavior, Hymenoptera contains bees, wasps, and ants. That was a taster of the many insect orders out there waiting to be encountered. And there are many more, but I'll leave you to enjoy uncovering them yourself. Hi! And there you have it. Taxonomy system simplified. Make sure that you wrote down those orders and the examples. Let's look at the anatomy of an ant. On a piece of paper, write down the first thing that pops in your mind when you hear the word ants. To me, it's just pain. 
because I've been bitten or stung many times by ants. Um, it's not fun. So write it down and you could pause the video to give you time to write the first thing that pops in your mind. Now let's look at the ant body parts. Let's start with the three main divisions in an insect with the head, thorax, and abdomen. You will notice that the antenna is right here, mandibles, the mouth right under, compound eyes, legs, claws. This bulbous part is called the gaster and then the stinger. Also, if you look at the head, you can see the compound eyes, the antennas, mandibles, they act like pincers, and the mouth. So, I need you to label the parts of the ant. As part of the materials that you receive for this honor, there's a picture in there where you can label each part. Just make sure that you draw a line and put the names. You could pause the video at any time because the next thing I'm going to do is just give you the key or the answers. So here's the key. You can see that I, again, labeled each part of the ant, at least the main parts, head, antennae, compound eyes, mandible mouth, the thorax. I forgot to label the legs. You could do that for me. The claws, the abdomen, the stinger, and the gaster. Let's look at the life cycle of the, butter life cycle of the butterfly. Sorry. Um, it's the best example of metamorphosis. Remember is that there is a striking change in each stage of the life of this insect. So let's look at this video. You could write down any information How do you, you make really a want butterfly? from this video. First, a butterfly lays an egg on a plant. A caterpillar hatches out of it and gets busy eating. As it eats, it grows and molts out of its skin to get even bigger, and repeats this until it is a fully grown caterpillar. It attaches itself to a plant and sheds its skin one last time to reveal its chrysalis. Inside, the tissues that made up the caterpillar rearrange to form a head and body, six legs, and four wings. Then, when its own genes and the climate indicate the time is right, out pops the butterfly. This entire cycle, from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly, is known as metamorphosis because the animal goes through striking, distinct life stages. Now our butterfly will find a mate so it can start the butterfly life cycle all over again. See live butterflies, moths, and chrysalis. There you have it. So let's look at the stages again. Egg, caterpillar, chrysalis or pupa stage, and then the adult stage. And you can see it repeated here again. So, in a separate piece of paper, I need you to obviously name it, life cycle of the butterfly, draw the four stages of the life cycle, and then pick a favorite stage, and I want you to tell me why. Okay? So you could pause it at any moment, so you could do this part. Me personally, I like the chrysalis or the pupa stage. It talks about transformation and I always equate it with the transforming power from a sinner to a person that has been redeemed by God and his son, Jesus Christ. Let's talk about non-beneficial insects or what we know as we know it as pests, termites. You definitely don't want those in your house. Um, then flies, mosquitoes. These are the insects that have caused more harm to humanity, mosquitoes, because they transmit uh, diseases. Locusts, obviously, for the fact that if they swarm, they'll devastate uh, large pieces of land. And obviously the cockroach. And I have experience with cockroach because in Puerto Rico, they have the two inch cockroach and they fly and they're just disgusting. Well, just to me. So how do you contain these pests? Well, there are many things that you could do. You could definitely talk to an organic farmer. They'll give you some other techniques that they use to keep pests away. This video that I'm going to show you is from Penn State. 
And basically, they're using other biological insects to attack uh, those pests that they want removed from the garden or from their plants. So here we go. Been dealt with by spraying pesticide, and that's certainly an effective way to deal with them. But it's kind of like a nuclear assault. You're actually killing beneficial insects. So you're messing up this symbiotic relationship that naturally occurs in nature. They can be really dangerous to people, especially when we're in this setting where there's so many students come in every day. There's research going in in all these greenhouses. Using biocontrols is really satisfying because it is working with a natural system instead of against it. Biological pest control is using good bugs to battle bad bugs. And in some cases, it's as simple as purchasing the right bug and releasing it at the right place in the right time. And they will either use the pest organism in the greenhouse as prey and eat it, or they will use it to complete their life cycle. And in the process of that, they will kill the pest organism. And they look very much like spider mites, but they're predators on spider mites. And when I got this grant, that provided a little bit of funding for me to have two interns dedicated to biocontrol each semester. Their job is to scout the greenhouses for the presence of pests. And they go out and look around uh, to see what pest problems we have in the greenhouse. And we keep some notes about what pests are where, and then we use that information to determine what biocontrol organisms to order. But down amongst them, there are these little orange maggots. We basically go out as a team and deploy those biocontrol organisms where they need to go. Hang the cards, release the wasps, dump the predatory mites onto the plants. Basically, we know where our pests are already, so we will implement them weekly in the same areas, but it's nice to monitor in the morning because we can actually see our progress developing. The biocontrols have actually been a big help in this greenhouse. When you're sprinkling this media everywhere, it's just like sawdust. It becomes almost mundane, which is like kind of bizarre that this like incredible process has become this mundane chore that I do at work. When I started doing this, I realized that the students really were interested in using biocontrols. I mean, for example, the, the parasitoid wasps that lay their eggs in those aphids, and then the maggot grows in the aphid and then pops out. It's like the movie Alien, right? That's what everyone thinks of. And that's pretty attractive to students. But we permit these barley plants to become completely infected with aphids. My first or second day of the job, Scott took me on a walk around, and he showed me the parasitized aphid, which we call a mummy. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. So when he recommended me for the biocontrol internship, I took it right away. The thing that I really like about my job is that I come here and it's like something new every day. I get to interact with different kinds of people, which I think is really relevant for the type of things that I want to do with my life, and kind of get an inside look on how all these people operate in the context of this sustainable environment. So it's really interesting to see how people are excited about it, how people want to be involved in it, and how they actually execute it. The number of pesticide applications that I'm making now is significantly less than before. I think we can continue to reduce the amount of pesticides we're using to a certain extent, although in some cases, pesticides are required for the research. We have a really awesome teaching operation in the College of Ag here, and a lot of plant science classes have greenhouse components, so they're actually students growing plants in the greenhouse. I want to reduce or eliminate pesticide applications on these teaching crops so that students will not be exposed to pesticide residues when they're coming in contact with their crops during the classwork. Messes have greenhouse components, so they're actually and there you have it. Students grow Another way to control insects. I want to well, let's talk about the beneficial insects like the bumblebee and the butterfly. They, so they are great pollinators. We have the silkworm that produces thread, silk thread, and we use them to the make clothing. The then we have the dragonfly that is a predator to other insects. And I added this one, fly larvae, and it's used for wound treatment therapy. 
for example, if you have a wound that needs to heal, they may put some of these larvae. It will eat away the rotting uh, dead materials and it will help with the healing process. So let's talk about two stories in which insects are mentioned. They're either the main character or they're just part of the story. The first one is Samson, the lion and the honeybee. So we have Samson, the strongest man in the Bible. He, there's a lion that attacks him, he kills him. And then many, many weeks or months pass and he comes by again and finds that in the carcass of the lion, there's a honeybee, honey beehive or honey hive. And what he does is he takes the honey and he uses that imagery of the lion and the honey to come up with a, ri a riddle to tease the bridegrooms. If you want to know more about this story, please read Judges chapter 14, 5 through 19. Then we have Jonah and the worm. Jonah was sent by God to preach, uh, to give a message to the Ninevites. They were going to, God was going to destroy them and God wanted to give them the last opportunity to repent. Jonah knew that God was very merciful and probably these people were going to repent. So he didn't want to do the job, but Jonah gets sent anyway and by force with a big fish. So he, he gets there, he preaches, they repent. Jonah goes to the top of a hill waiting for the fireworks. God allows this, uh, this plant to grow and, um, and it provides uh, protection from the heat and the sun. And Jonah is very happy, but then God sends a worm and destroys a plant. And Jonah is very upset. So God is trying to make a point in here, not only to Jonah, but also to us, that he is very merciful. And sometimes we see things that we would like God to destroy, but God is very merciful, giving plenty of opportunities for humanity to repent and to be saved. So let's keep that in mind. So that is found in Jonah chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. So here's the final activity. You need to mount a collection of 20 different insects representing at least six orders. You must exclude from this collection butterflies and moth. You need to be careful how you mount them. That's going to be part of your, the work that you're going to present to your director or to your instructor. Each insect must be labeled properly with a common name and their scientific name that includes both the genus and the species and make sure that to mention the order. You could do that or you could use this other option where you take 20 photographs of different insects, make sure that they represent six different orders, exclude moth or butterfly. They need to be photographed. You need to put the date when it was photographed, the common name, the order, and the scientific name that includes both the genus and the species. There you have it. So this is your final activity. So before I, before we end this presentation, I need to remind you that there are other materials that I included in the packet that was sent to the directors and to your parents. It includes other materials. It goes into more depth. There might be some crossword puzzles. There might be some uh, extra information about insects. You're welcome to read it and make sure that you use that as part of the work that's going to be presented to your director so that they can give you this batch. So let's go over the summary. Insects are part of this large animal group called the arthropods. They're easy to identify. They have that exoskeleton because they're invertebrates. They are quickly identified because they have head, thorax, and abdomen. They have six legs, and some of these insects have wings, and, and all of them have antennas. Insects go through this process of transformation called metamorphosis, at least most of them. Insects are beneficial for pollination of plants, and also insects can carry diseases. So there you have it. All about insects. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We're so blessed to have been able to study about insects. 
and how you use them to teach us lessons of life and all about your love and your compassion. Please be with each Pathfinder, their parents, their directors, their instructors, the church, and their community, and allow them to be like Jesus Christ, to grow in intelligence and wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. And welcome back. I have our distinguished professor of the afternoon, of the night, uh, Erminio Guevara. Erminio, thank you for the presentation you're giving us today. Is there anything else you want to share with our audience? Well, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm glad that you guys liked the presentation. And if you have any questions, please email them to the conference. It is capital S, lowercase n, E C y o u t h zero four at gmail.com and we'll take those questions and we'll answer them back to you so just uh, so, again it's snack youth zero four at gmail.com so that you can take it away that's excellent Herminio, thank you so much for your time uh for putting this material together for us and we hope everybody enjoys it with that we say good afternoon good evening goodbye